and I thank you for joining the NIH webinar. The title is Updates to NIH Training Grant and Applications. And so I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am Anissa Brown, the Chief of Research Training and Career Development at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. Please note this webinar is not intended to be comprehensive of all of the expectations for institutional training grants. And so before I actually introduce the team and we get started with the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping announcements. And the first one is the slides for today's webinar are available online. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted as soon as possible. The other thing is following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. We will start with the questions that were previously submitted. There is a Q&A box that you can use to provide live questions. We will do our best to get to all questions. We do have an FAQ available on the webpage associated with this topic, and we will do our best to include the questions that we're unable to get to in that FAQ. So with that said, let me just introduce you to the presentation team. One second. And so the presenters for today will be Dr. Erica Boone, who is the Director of the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce in the Office of Extramural Research. We also have Dr. Kenneth Gibbs, a Branch Chief in the Division of Training, Workforce Development and Diversity, also known as TWD, at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. And then we also have a number of individuals from our Office of Extramural Research that will be helping behind the scenes with questions and providing you with resources they are Dr. Anastasia Hardson, Dr. Terea Donaldson, Dr. Ben Roberts, and we also have Dr. Lynn Morin with us here today. So let me quickly just walk through the topics for the presentation today. We're going to start with the background and motivations for changes. And so Dr. Erica Boone will be providing us with those details, followed by Dr. Kenneth Gibbs that will talk about the changes to the NIH training grant applications. And then we will have Dr. Boom back that will talk about the implementation plans, and then we'll move into our Q&A session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Boom to get us started with the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to today's presentation. Alrighty, so I'm going to discuss more of the background and motivation for change for changes to the um, uh, training grants here at the NIH. Um, so a major goal uh, for NIH is to enhance and strengthen the biomedical research workforce. And as you are aware, biomedical research training has undergone considerable changes over the past several years. And in order to meet these changes, the NIH has sponsored several programs. Um, as you can see here on the slide, I give an indication or an example of some of them. Uh, two of them are common funds, including BEST or Broadening Experiences in Science. And this particular initiative focuses on enhancing training opportunities to prepare early career investigators for a variety of options in the dynamic um, biomedical workforce landscape. Uh, there's also the Diversity Program Consortium, or DPC, another common fund initiative, uh, which consists of a network of institutions funded by NIH to improve training and mentoring via the development implementation, assessment, and dissemination of innovative, effective approaches to research training and mentoring. As many of you are also aware, in 2023, NIH convened an ACD advisory committee um, that was charged with enhancing postdoctoral training, um, uh, and this resulted in a report entitled Re-Envisioning NIH Supported Postdoctoral Training Opportunities. And there are six different recommendations that this advisory committee or this working group to the advisory committee um, has developed all to support research training, uh, career development and mentoring opportunities for um, postdocs uh, within the biomedical research workforce. And then lastly, uh, not mentioned here in the slide, but I wanted to bring it up is that um, more recently, NIH also convened an advisory council to revise review criteria and the application process for fellowships. And within this, there is more emphasis on support regarding mentorship, research training, and other development needs for fellowship candidates to assist them along their developmental career development uh, pathways. 
All right. So as an extension to some of the work that I mentioned on the previous slide, NIH is also focusing on improving training experiences for individuals that are receiving training on training grants. Um, back in 2020, NIH launched the UNITE initiative, uh, which was charged with identifying and addressing structural barriers that exist within the biomedical research workforce um, and also addressing them. Uh, one of the working groups within UNITE is UNITE E, and this particular working group focuses on um, efforts, its efforts on promoting equity within the NIH supported biomedical research ecosystem. So about two years ago, UNITE E charged a small working group to further incorporate language into NIH's parent NOFOs. Um, to strengthen mentoring opportunities. And we'll talk more about that today. But the roots of this effort to update language regarding um, mentoring expectations as a means to support the growth of the biomedical research workforce started several years ago. Um, uh, and one of the major players in this uh, effort of change was NIGMS. And they took it upon themselves to pilot some language in their T32s, encouraging institutions to improve mentoring and training environments for its trainees. So in today's presentation, we're going to hear more about this effort. All righty, so um, what are the goal and the, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, uh, let me go back. I think I took us a little bit too far. I'm getting a little bit too excited about today's uh, webinar. So let's talk a little bit about the goals and the scope um, of training grant updates. So basically, we're trying to reduce applicant and reviewer burden by streamlining some of the data that is collected within the application and uh, also to enhance other aspects of the application process to further support the development of a biomedical research workforce that will benefit from a full range of perspectives, experiences, backgrounds, et cetera, in order to advance um, uh, research discovery. Uh, the scope. Uh, so the applications that use the, the training or T instructions in the SF424 or the research training data, uh, uh, data tables are included below. So these are the activity codes that will uh, incorporate the changes that you will hear more about today. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the published guide notice. Um, if you don't um, have this guide notice, it is NOTOD 24-129. And it entails or provides a lot of the information within this notice that you will see today. All right, so let's talk about the process for the change. So I indicated in the last uh, couple of slides um, that these changes that you're gonna hear more about today um, had its antecedents in about two years ago. So two years ago, a small working group um, was charged um, to update the parent T32 NOFO and identify additional changes that were needed to reinforce um, some of the um, changes that were gonna be taking place within the NOFO. So they're gonna be instructional changes that you'll hear a bit about today, as well as data table, table changes. And some of the individuals that were a part of this smaller working group are also a part of today's webinar. And that includes Dr. Anissa Brown from NIDCR and Dr. Kenneth Gibbs from NIGMS. So this group um, had met uh, many, many times over the course of the last couple of years. Um, and they presented a set of recommendations um, to be implemented uh, that you will be seeing today. So that brings us from 2022 to 2023, and now in 2024, we're working to operationalize the recommendations uh, into an actual product that you all will see within the research, biomedical research workforce ecosystem. Um, and these uh, application changes are going to be implemented for applications that have the due dates on or after January 25th of 2025. Now I'm going to hand over the mic uh, to my colleague, Dr. Kenneth Gibbs, to put into context um, uh, the targeted updates that I've kind of mentioned to you before. Um, I want to remind everyone that there's not a wholesale restructuring of review criteria for our training grants, but there are some revisions within the training grant application and process that we definitely want you all to be ready for and aware of. So, Kenny, I'd like to hand it over to you. You can take it away. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Boone. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And I'm happy to walk you through the next few slides and give a few more details about the changes that are coming forward. Um, and again, I point you to the guide notice that was published on Friday with more details. OK, and so here are a four big overview, overview of the four big updates. First is the application form, the PHS 398 Research Training Form, where the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will become its own attachment. Currently, it's within the 25-page program plan. It will be its own attachment. We'll speak about that more in a moment. We're going to be adding language regarding mentor training expectations and supporting a breadth of career outcomes, particularly to parent T-series NOFOs. Um, for the peer review, as Erica mentioned, we're not doing a wholesale change. Um, as is always the case for NIH NOFOs, we only want to review on what we ask you for. We only ask what we're going to review for. But the main thing that's going to happen as it relates to the review criteria is that the training in RCR and the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will go from being additional review considerations, meaning they're only considered after the score, to being elements that reviewers can cons consider as part of the overall impact score. So we'll talk about that more later. And then the NRSA data tables. The goal there, we're going to have some updates, streamlining, as uh, Dr. Boone mentioned, to reduce the burden and promote consistent information collection across the various training stages. So I'll go through those one by one. This is on the right is an example of the current PHS 398 research training program plan form. In it, there are um, five different attachments, number two through six, <laughs> um, but there is the program plan and then the plans for instruction in RCR, methods to enhance reproducibility, MPI leadership plan if applicable, and progress report for renewal applications. Within the program plan currently, which is sort of the meat of a training grant application, there's 25 pages which considers, which can includes the background, the program plan section, and then the recruitment plan to enhance diversity. And so again, that is the end of the 25 page program plan. And so what NIH is doing is that you will see this is the updated form going forward. And so now that, um, the, that attachment well, the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will be its own attachment. And so we'll have the program plan, the recruitment plan to enhance diversity, RCR and reproducibility, MPI leadership plan, and the progress report. This will be three pages, um, just like the plan for RCR and the plan for enhancing reproducibility. And really the thought is that, you know, all of these elements are integral to strong training programs, both training and rigor, training in um, uh, responsible conduct and ensuring that there's a strong recruitment plan in place to uh, allow individuals from all backgrounds to participate in the research training program. And so we're going to just treat them similarly from the point of application and the point of peer review. And so that's the one change that you'll see. Instead of the recruitment plan to being, uh, being part of the 25 page program plan, it will be its own attachment. So you have more time, more space to elaborate on your recruitment activities. Next, we'll talk about some of the instructional changes that we anticipate. One, as uh, Dr. Boone mentioned, is on mentor training expectations. And so again, NIH has over the last decade funded uh, the National Research Mentoring Network, which developed you know, evidence-informed approaches to research mentoring and training. And we look at other resources like the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's uh, report on the science of effective mentoring in STEM. And all of these have shown that formal training and effective evidence-informed mentoring practices improves the knowledge and mentoring skills of research mentors across career stages. So it's not just a thing for early career uh, investigators, but all faculty benefit from, you know, being trained, having professional development and evidence-informed mentoring practices. And importantly, access to high quality mentoring through structured training programs, like NIH training programs, has been linked to enhanced trainee productivity and enhancing their commitment to a research career, which are things that, as an agency interested in strengthening the biomedical research workforce, are very important to us. And so we are going to incorporate mentor training language into the Parent T32 program considerations, program plan instructions, and review criteria. Um, and so we go to the next, uh, on the next slide, we'll give a little bit more on that. Okay, so here's an example. These are examples of language that we will see. Um, but just to let you all start to think about 
um, how your institution can begin to uh, meet these expectations. So funded programs will be expected to support effective mentorship by ensuring that all program faculty complete formal mentor training with appropriate periodic refreshers. We are not laying out what it has to be. We're just saying relevant to the goals of the program, there should be appropriate training and effective mentorship practices. We have pulled from the literature and there are a number of different um, resources that are in the literature that you can see about what are important evidence-based and evidence-informed mentorship practices, but things including aligning expectations, how to make sure that faculty mentors maintain effective communication, and actually it's, you know, it's bi-directional. How do we foster appropriate independence, assessing uh, their understanding of scientific research, and how to even help faculty articulate their mentoring philosophy and plan so that there are aligned expectations. And so these are examples of topics that institutions are encouraged to pursue as they think about the training that they will have for the faculty who are serving as mentors on NIH training grants. Okay, and so again, the program plan, we ask for it in the consideration, we ask for it in the instruction as you're filling out the program plan. And so currently we have the program faculty section it's a subsection of the program plan. And so usually it just says, who are the faculty? And we will continue to want to know who the faculty are, but we're also going to ask specifically about the planned mentor training and oversight structure as we think about who the program faculty are. And so or application applicant organizations can think about, for example, the plan strategy and administrative structure to oversee and monitor the program mentoring to make sure there is a, a appropriate match and effective training progress and to describe how the participating faculty are going to be trained to ensure the use of these evidence-informed mentoring practices that promote the development really of trainees from all backgrounds, including those from groups underrepresented in the biomedical research enterprise. And if we ask for it, we will review for it. And so we're going to incorporate a few additional questions into the review criteria to align with these changes. Similarly, we're looking at training career development. And so right now, the program plan has in the proposed training section will be updated to incorporate instructions on program activities that promote trainee career development. Here are things you might think about, for example. How are they going to be trained for careers in the biomedical research workforce? And we're using this phrase intentionally. Careers in the biomedical research workforce are the breadth of careers that sustain the biomedical research enterprise, which includes, but is not exclusive to, careers as an NIH-funded investigator. It can even include working at the NIH like myself. Um, but we, we, we joke and say, you know, how do we make sure we are, people are um, prepared for the breadth of careers that they can use their training for and that will utilize their training? And then how the program will provide appropriate learning opportunities, appropriate learning opportunities. We know that they're very, NIH training programs are flexible, but what are the appropriate learning opportunities, anything from informational interviews to maybe internships as appropriate, that allow trainees to develop the professional skills and the networks that they need to transition into those applicable careers. And so again, the review criteria will be updated to align with what's being asked. Next, the tables, everybody's favorite part of the training grant application. And so the overall goal here is to streamline, to reduce burden, and to promote consistency in what is requested. And so at base, we are asking you to do less or in some places just move where you're doing things from the application into the chain table. So let's walk through this. Here are a few examples. Table one is the census for participating department and interdepartmental programs. So currently on T32 applications, you are asked to provide information on all the pre-doctorates and the postdoctorates, regardless of the training stage of the program. And so if it's a pre-doc only program, you ask information, you still have to require information on postdocs. If it's a postdoc only program, you still have to in information on pre-docs. And so here's the planned update. You will only be required to provide data on the training stages relevant to that program. If it's a mixed stage program, you'll still need to provide information on both stages. But if it's a pre-doc only program, you only need to provide information on pre-docs. If it's a postdoc only program, you only provide information on postdocs. Um, and that same um, ethos is gonna be carried forward to table two, where we still have that, that information. Uh, it'll be stage specific and that's in the notice. 
So that's for T32 applications. And then, again, when we talk about standardizing information for undergrad or T34 programs, which are exclusively at NIGMS, but we're thinking about how do we make sure that information is collected in a standard manner. Right now, it's collected in a variable manner, and it's part of the program plan. And so we're actually taking that out so those applicants can be on level footing with all other applicants at NIH. And so that by that, I mean Table 1 will not be a requirement for um, undergrad programs. Um, and it won't be another attachment, but it'll be standard like it's collected for other programs. But that said, the information is already being collected, so we're just moving what we're asking for. Table 8, program outcomes. Here's another example. You are currently asked T32s to include clearly associated trainees. We have heard the feedback that it's not clear who to include, and so we are removing Part 2, those clearly associated with training grants. As applicable, you are able to report the broader impact in the program plan section and the RPPR narrative. So that is ways that we are streamlining. Here are another couple changes that we want to highlight for you. Table five, the publications of those in training. Currently, it's oriented around the training faculty as opposed to the trainee outcomes. And since they're training grants, we want to focus it more on the trainees. And so we know that program faculty can move. And if a program faculty move between competitive segments, those trainees actually aren't included in the grant. And so what we're going to do is realign the table to focus on the outcomes for the trainees supported by the grant. We are additionally going to allow the inclusion of interim research progress uh, products like preprints only when we don't have the final publication available. And so this is similar to what is happening already for research project grants, F grants, and K applications. So a trainee could put in their own fellowship and cite their preprint, but the instructions don't allow the training grant to do that. So we're just making it consistent, right? Um, and so again, but we only want that if you don't have the final peer review publication. And we trust that you all will follow instructions clearly, closely. <laughs> um, and then again, thinking about making it aligned appropriately for undergraduates, we know that you know undergraduates sometimes don't have publications, but they do things like external published conference abstracts. So for undergrads only, undergrad training only, we are in addition to what we have for preprints, we're allowing external published conference abstracts. So. This is an example of what that table will look like in the updates. The leftmost column now is the trainee name, followed by the faculty member, and then the same information that we have right now, past or current, what's the training period, and what are the publications. You will notice in the middle, uh, trainee name Daniel Barr, we included an example of a preprint. And so those are examples of how we're updating to try to promote consistency and to focus on the trainee experience. You will also be able to um, add up to two mentors and denote the other mentor, um, up to two mentors and denote former trainers with an asterisk. So if Dr. Chu left the university, we can still incorporate the outcomes relevant to the training grant as part of the um, application. Finally, table six, um, applicants, entrance, and their characteristics of the past five years. Currently, T32 applicants collect detailed training characteristics on anybody who applied for or entered the training program. And so for pre-docs, that is the mean number of months of prior research experience, prior institutions where they did that, as well as their GPA. And for postdocs, it's how many publications in their prior institutions. NIH, though, particularly in this updates, we're going to be encouraging multifactorial candidate review processes to promote opportunities for a broad group of research-oriented trainees to participate in the program. And importantly, program admissions is the applicant organization responsibilities. We are focusing on post-appointment outcomes. And so the update is that we're going to remove those above reference training characteristics from table six. Um, and so we still want to know what the pool is, but those detailed characteristics will no longer need to be a part of the table. And so here we go. Here's an example. It's a slimmed down version of what you see now, the same information including information about um, the uh, number, uh, the percent of candidates who are applying from underrepresented groups. <clears throat> and so again, and we will slightly update the title just to make sure the verbiage is consistent. Applicants are really the organization, so now we're gonna call them training program candidates, but the information's all the same. And so again, less information is what we're asking you to um, fill in. 
Finally, peer review updates. Training grants will retain the five scored criteria. Training grants are, we know there are a lot of changes happening, but training grant application updates are not part of the simplifying review efforts. And so if you've seen that for fellowships or research project grants, that's a separate track. Uh, we're keeping things where they are. We're only, again, only updates are to align with what is being asked, these other changes. But the major structural change is that the training in the responsible conduct of research and the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will become additional review criteria that contribute to the overall impact score instead of being post score considerations. And so again, we went through that quickly. The slides are available. The guide notice is there, but hopefully you can see how this will strengthen NIH's ability to support strong biomedical research training while reducing the burden on applicants um, and promoting you know, strong mentoring environments and career outcomes for trainees. With that, I turn over back to the esteemed Dr. Boone for implementation plans. All right, here I am, here I am. Right. Okay, I was, I was gonna say, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going if I need to, there you go. I, right. was, I was in the Q&A trying to help to answer Thank some you. of the questions from the community because they're coming in fast and furious. So um, as Dr. Gibbs indicated, we'll talk more about implementation plans. So when will all of these things um, become active and available? So as we've mentioned a couple of times during today's presentation, uh, implementation of these changes are effective for a receipt date for applications that are due on or after January 25th of 2025. You see the list of activity codes um, where these changes will become relevant. Also keep in mind, if an activity code does not require a recruitment plan to enhance diversity, then the changes with regards to the recruitment plan to uh, enhance diversity that have been mentioned in this webinar will not be applicable for that particular mechanism. But take a look at these activity codes on this screen as well. I mentioned later on that there will be resources that are available to the public. So you don't have to remember any of this stuff. You don't have to take screenshots or any of that we're gonna have public information available. So um, you'll have an indication of when the effective dates are as well as the um, activity codes uh, where these changes will need to be implemented. So what are our implementation timelines? Um, so between uh, now and, and late summer, uh, we intend to publish um, updated uh, data tables. In early fall, we will publish the parent T32 NOFO no later than um, October or mid to late October. We understand that it takes a lot of effort and time to put together a, uh, a training grant application. And we want to make sure that individuals, um, oh, I'm sorry, that uh, institutions are have enough time in order to be able to do this, okay? Um, so uh, as it says on the slide, as we're reminded that the changes are effective for due dates on or after January 25 of 2025. So how do you learn more information? Um, I mentioned resources um, uh, a little while ago. So now let's talk about those resources that are available to the public. So where can you go to receive more information about updates to training grants? There is a public web page that is live right now that uh, provides uh, updates to our institutional training grant applications. It gives information about the background, the activity codes where it's relevant, some resource documents. Uh, FAQs will also be available pretty soon as well. Um, so make sure that uh, you take a look at this site. And as we develop additional resources, we'll make sure to update this training page or this web page so that you receive the latest and the greatest with regards to updates to our training grants here at NIH. So here's a listing of other resources that are currently available as well. So make sure that you're checking out the NIH research training uh, web page. Um, and that one is researchtraining.nih.gov. Um, if you find information there, it will link you out uh, to relevant information regarding updates to the training grants. As well, I mentioned the fellowships earlier in the presentation, so there will be information there as well. Um, here are uh, information about the data tables will be coming for, um, forthright. Um, also, 
please reach out to your IC contacts. Um, reach out to your review officer, your grants management officer with regards to budget related questions, your program um, officer with relation to your um, questions about application requirements and also ICO priorities. If you have questions about X train or X track, not who goes into it, what are the people that go into it, but how you fill it out, then reach out to the ERA service desk with those types of questions with regards to X-Train and X-Track. Um, as we come to a close, I'd like to thank our Unite E working group for the seminal work that they've done in order to help to improve research training opportunities for our earlier career um, 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 scientists or investigators. Um, also, uh, you know, helping us to to develop changes for the training grants where we're recognizing that um, mentors are also in need of additional opportunities to improve their mentorship skills as well. Um, the the actioning, you know, that people don't want to spend their time filling out these T32 applications with all of this information that they're not really sure if they're doing right. So streamlining has been a um, a really significant part of the work of this working group. Um, we've had a myriad of individuals from across NIH to help us with this work, including on the NRSA tables, as well as the list and host of advisors um, and implementers that are helping us with this. Um, I'd also like to give a humongous thanks to Dr. Kenneth Gibbs, to Dr. Anissa Brown, and to the members and staff for the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I think we're gonna bring our moderator and our other hosts back on camera now to go into our Q&A. Yeah, so first and foremost, as Dr. Boone and Dr. Gibbs catch their breath, I do wanna say thank you for presenting a wealth of details about the upcoming changes. And we will now move to the Q&A session, which I know everybody has been waiting for. We've been seeing some questions come into the Q&A chat. So please continue to add your questions to the Q&A. Again, we will do our best to also try to include them in the FAQs. What we're gonna start with first are the questions that were previously submitted. And so I also thank you, Anastasia Harson, Dr. Anastasia Harson, that will be joining us to also help with questions that we have people in the background helping to assist with answering questions. So to kick off the Q&A, I have the first question. It's probably the most important question is that how are people going to find the NOFOs or Notice of Funding Opportunity Announcements related to the changes that you all have been discussing today? And so- I'll, I'm happy to Kenny, kick, I'm happy, I'm happy to kick. Let's see, Erica is speaking. So this is actually pretty um, similar to every other NOFO. And so everything that we put out is in the NIH guide. And additionally, you can look on the NIH, the wonderful research training site that Erica's team has put together that has a compendium of resources. Um, and then this is, we're giving high level changes as always in the details. And so sometimes there are notices of funding opportunity that won't be reissued, but we might give you some additional instructions to say, how do you comply with this going forward? And so if that's the case, you'll just look in the related notices section at the very top of the, of the funding opportunity. Um, and that's pretty standard across all of NIH funding opportunities, but look for the guide, uh, look for the related notices, and um, we will be making resources available um, as, as they come. So keep an eye out. We're not trying to surprise people. And we have till January. So I'll take a deep breath. We got plenty of time. Um, okay, go ahead, Anissa. I, I'm sorry, Erica. I, I, did you? I want to make a plug for the NIH guide to grants and contracts. Just anyway. So I think that um, I'm pretty sure that everybody that's here on to or participating in today's webinar is already uh, signed up to receive those automatic updates. So if there's anything that's important coming out of NIH with regards to grants and contracts it's gonna be um, on this page for grants and contracts. So make sure that you sign up for this so that the information can come to you. You don't have to go and look for it. Thank you. So if you were signed up, you would have known about that notice that Dr. Boone has mentioned that came out last Friday. Um, so let's move on to the next question. And so Dr. Gibbs, I'm actually going to ask you to address this question, is that how will the changes that you all have discussed today impact renewal applications? 
Okay, great. Um, and so all applications, uh, you know, new renewal resubmission will follow the guidelines and instructions in the NOFO. Again, a point I want to reiterate here is that NIH is the Institutes of Health, emphasis with the S on institutes, right? And so we are speaking about sort of centralized guidelines that we're going to have, particularly for the parents' announcements. Many ICOs put out their own training announcements. And so what's going to be, the tables are for everybody, right? Um, and they'll be more streamlined across all the application types. Plans for mentor training are existing and will continue to exist for everybody. Um, and review will take into account RCR and the recruitment plan as part of the overall impact. Um, but ultimately, you'll need to look at the specific funding opportunity um, to see how it impacts. But uh, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, so you actually touched a little bit on another question that I actually have. So maybe you can reemphasize the points okay. of kind of how the changes apply to non-parent training grants. Okay. So you did mention yeah. that. Oh, bit. great. Yeah, yeah. So as always, follow the NOFO. So the one thing you should hear is follow the funding opportunity. And whenever you read it, it'll say a few things. It'll say, follow the SF-424. And these changes are part of the SF-424. It'll say follow SF-424 and these additional instructions, or just follow these instructions that are here. Um, but across NIH, you know, um, we're seeking to align. And so NIH is making tweaks to the SF-424 to align with these changes. Um, so if you are called to follow the NOFO, or the, sorry, the SF-424, you'll be impacted. But the tables are NIH-wide, and so that's going to be applicable to all NOFOs, parent or non-parent. And all T's will have RCR and recruitment plan as part of the additional review criteria. And so if it's already in the NOFO, it won't be reissued, like an NIGMS's NOFOs. That said, we're working to get, uh, but other NOFOs will continue to be reissued in alignment with these um, criteria. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I am, sorry, Dr. Gibbs, I'm going to come back to you again. And so we talked done, about I'm the done. potential <laughs> impact on renewal applications. But what about our PPRs? Yes. The main change is for the tables. And if you're a T32, it'll be less work. And so there will be no part two of table eight, those clearly associated with the training grant. You can always describe relevant information in the body of the text, but we're not overall changing the RPPR instructions with the exception of we're changing the table instructions. And so since the RPPRs incorporate the tables, then that is what's going to happen. Now, this is for after January 25th, 2025. So if your RPPR is due before then, keep going what we're doing with our instruction set. Uh, that said, you know, after January, we're good to go. <laughs> well, according to all of the reactions and the hearts and the thumbs up, uh, yes, people are really feeling this. They're less work. Let's put the work. We're, we're, tr we're trying. We aim to be yeah. a responsive agency while still providing appropriate oversight. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll, I'll give Kenny a slight break or Dr. Gibbs, I'm sorry. No. Um, <laughs> so Dr. Boo, let me ask you a question. Is that do, how do these changes, do they have any effect on international training grants? And if so, what is that impact? Right. So just like Kenny said, all of the information that you need is in, within the NOFO. You know, several times throughout um, this presentation, we've laid out specifically which activity codes um, um, are going to be impacted by these changes. So just take a look within the NOFO and you'll find out what you need to do. You know, the NOFO is almost, I won't say it's your Bible, but it's definitely your instruction manual for what you need to do and how to submit a responsive grant. And I think that because people don't necessarily have the NOFO right now, there may be a little bit more anxiety or angst because they're like, really, what is this going to entail? But um, the NOFOs will be available for the public. Um, we're hoping towards the end of the summer um, so that, you know, folks can really get an indication of what is being required of them and what are the changes and how does it apply um, to, to their institution and their applications. So check so again, off. Make sure you subscribe to the guide and you will get firsthand notification when those NOFOs are out. So we're just going to kind of jump to budget. So we talked about a lot of changes. And so, of course, people are probably thinking, how does that impact the budgets? 
So can either Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Boone talk about any potential impact on the budgets for the institutional training grants and how people can get more information about these potential, this potential impact, if there is any? Erica, you want to do that? Uh, <laughs> we both said <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, I, I'll, I'll say, you know, the updates are not going to change how the budgets are prepared. Um, and so, and there is a link that I think one of our, 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 our staff is going to put in about how to develop your budget, just so people know that. Um, you should always reach out to the grants management contact in the budget, I'm oh, sorry, on the funding opportunity. Um, we will aim to make it clear that um, you know, costs associated with mentor training activities are part or can be part of the training related expenses, right? And so we'll aim to clarify that. Um, as it stands currently, there's a lot of flexibility that organizations have with the TREs, the training related expenses. Um, and so we're just going to try to make it clear that this is, um, that this is part of it. Um, yeah. I do, I do also want to say, because I saw that there were lots of questions about who's going to pay for this mentor training, right? Um, the, the training of the mentors extends beyond just the trainees that are participating in the training grants in and of themselves. And I'm sure that there are lots of opportunities for training that the institutions already have in place mm -hmm. um, that will be applicable for that. So just really re re remember that. And also, Kenny did also indicate um, that there's some flexibility within the, the TREs in and of itself. But talk to your program officer, talk to your grants management specialist to, to see, you know, what exactly is the flexibility with regards to that. But just remember, you know, the, the skills that this mentor um, is gaining um, to be able to support the current needs, you know, of their trainees should not just be limited to the trainees. It improves um, the, the trainees' capabilities. It improves um, the training environment for our trainees. It's an institutional benefit, so it should probably be thought about in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, give me some money for that. <laughs> So thank you. And so as you can see, we have Dr. Anastasia Hardison with us. She is a cu customer relations manager in the area of extract and extrain. So I have a question for you, Dr. Hardison. How will these updates or changes be supported in extract? So extract generates tables based on what the forms are. So we, just like the last time we went through a forms update, extract is gonna start generating the tables to match and align with them. Um, so keep an eye out on your inboxes because ERA is gonna send out communications once that transition is coming into place and we'll have a cutoff. We'll notify everyone of the cutoff um, when the system will start generating the new table format versus the one that we are currently doing. Um, and then also if there's you know questions with the tables, we kind of mentioned this earlier. If it's a, how do I fill out? Like, where do I go? What do I do? That's an ERA service desk question. Otherwise, um, NIH train is a good resource of what do I put into the table and how do I, you know, how do I list? Um, so one of the big things that's going to be coming is, you know, table eight, part two, which is asking for those clearly associated with the program. You're no longer going to be putting those in. We're going to only pull in trainees on uh, funded grants for renewals, revisions. Um, and then for the RPPR as well. So things like that, um, just keep an eye out. Uh, we try to communicate often and frequent. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank and you. I just wanna say real quick, I want y'all to keep those, those applauses going for Anastasia <laughs> because she and her team work really, really hard to make this happen. And so program people have ideas and people like Anastasia and her team um, make them happen. Uh, with a lot of flexibility. So I just want to make sure that she and her team get the shine that they deserve. Um, Thank okay. you. Yes. And so is it knowing how much people love the tables and given the fact that we are talking about some changes to the tables, will, will there be examples of the tables? And I know Dr. Gibbs, you presented some in the presentation for all of the tables, where will be able, people be able to find the examples reflecting these changes? Yes. And so, uh, again, I think that link will be put into the chat, but the NIH data table website will have um, those put in to reflect the updates. Now, I'm just going to go. I saw in the chat, my renewal is due on September 25th, 2024. 
These changes are effective January 25th, 2025. And so if your renewal is due this year, you are using the current system and the current tables. You are not, if, if you do not follow them, you will be non-compliant and there, you may be withdrawn or, you know, prior review. So uh, change takes time. Um, and as is always the case, there's somebody on one side or the other of the cut point. But I saw that in the chat and just wanted to, you know, uh, don't, don't go early and start doing that. Follow what's in the NOFO and the NOFOs all currently have uh, the current forms, which is what we're using. Thank you, Kenny. And so again, we're trying to provide you with this information in preparation for the changes that are coming. And we apologize for any confusion that it may be creating for you, but hopefully you find it more useful <laughs> than anything. <laughs> and so let me, um, so I know Dr. Gibbs, you did a, a very detailed presentation of the changes. We may have had some people that have joined late. We keep talking about these changes. Is it any way kind of really briefly you can kind of summarize the changes that people should expect with those tables really briefly. Okay, uh, okay. no, okay. Um, <laughs> table for pre-doc, T32, T32, pre-doc or post-doc. Table one and two were only asked for stage-specific information. Table five for all of them will be reoriented so that we're focusing on the trainee first, followed by who they were trained by, and will allow for the inclusion of preprints. Um, we also see the question in the chat about hyperlinks. So thank you for that question. We will update to make sure everything is aligned appropriately and complies with policy. Table six, fewer characteristics. And then table eight, part two, those clearly associated with the grant is going away. And then for undergraduates, we are introducing table one because that information is already collected in the application. We're just moving it to the standard tables to standardize how we are collecting it. And then for undergrads specifically, we're also allowing the inclusion of external um, published abstracts. So for national conferences, for example, because those are appropriate um, outcomes for research training at an undergraduate level. Guess where else people can find this information? Where, Dr. Boone? On the grants.nih.gov website. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so maybe, and again, our colleague Ben can put the notice in the uh, chat so everybody can see that note OD 24129. We know it just came out a few days ago, and so you haven't had time to absorb it fully, but it's there. And Thank you so we're much, also going to be developing additional resources, like for ex example, a side by side table um, to give an indication of you know what currently you know the requirements are, and then how those are going to be updated for applications due on or after January 25 of 2025. Okay, thank you. So I'm actually going to get into maybe some few questions that are kind of indirectly related to the information presented. And so I'm going to start with the first one. And so Dr. Boone, maybe if you can provide a response for this question, is that are any of these changes expected to impact um, the training grant eligibility requirements? No. I will just <laughs> make it very, very simple. No. Thank you for that very Keep brief right response. There. Thank you. So then the other question is, how do the training grants fit into the career development cycle for students and postdocs? Kind of just bringing this all together for people. Um, the, the, the goals, objectives, et cetera, are the same. We're just trying to help advance or enhance opportunities for an individual. So participation in NIH research training programs has the overall goal of producing scholars that have the necessary skills to move to the next phase of their careers and contribute to the advancement of the biomedical research workforce. That is the goal. That is what it was yesterday. That is what it is today. That is what it will be tomorrow. And uh, I think that probably many of us who are on this call today have participated in some sort of way or benefited in some sort of way from NIH research training opportunities, whether they were in fellowships. I had an F31 and an F32. Um, I was also on a training grant for one year in graduate school. So, you know, it, it these programs have, you know, they provide so much benefit to individuals um, that are either staying in research and continuing in research 
or part of the research, you know, workforce for a little while. But then we're also now contributing to it in a vast number of other ways, like we are on this call right now. So these programs are really important for giving people the necessary skills, exposure, experiences to a broad of way, a uh, broad array of opportunities to benefit the biomedical research workforce. Very long answer, but there we go. That's okay. But I'm going to actually ask you to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that, but focusing on NIH's focus to expand opportunities for those that are in small and rural areas, thinking about the idea states. If maybe um, you can talk a little bit about that. I'll invite Kenny to start off on that one. Uh, thank you so much. And again, we, we're seeing some things in the chat. We know there's an evolving landscape. We'll give more resources as, uh, as they become available. So, um, Stay tuned for the FAQs as it relates to some of the topics mentioned today. That said, there are some specific NOFOs um, and ICs have the opportunity that are focused on, for example, you know, idea states. And so the IDEA program is a congressionally mandated program to support or a research capacity in states that historically get less research funding. So NIGMS, for example, recently published a NOFO called LEAD MSTP. And so it's a medical scientist training program that is specific to um, applicant organizations in idea states or that are historically black colleges and universities or tribal colleges and universities. These are all um, areas that we can target consistent with applicable law. Um, we also have a number of different NOFOs and you'll see this across NIH. Sometimes we can target based on the amount of existing funding that you have already. And so at NIGMS, we have programs like URISE and GRISE, but through the UNITE initiative, there was what's called an S10 or an instrumentation grant that has been made available strictly for um, resource limited institutions. And um, other offices are really aiming to provide greater outreach for research active institutions, including Dr. Marie Bernard's office. And so we really are thinking about how we can leverage the full spectrum because we know that rigorous research training and rigorous research can happen in a lot of environments, geographies, mm -hmm. including uh, in institutions with different types of institutional resources. And so, I and Kenny has ahead. mentioned some of those UNITE um, funding initiatives, and they can also be found on the UNITE, uh, I think it's Infrastructural Racism website, where some of these resources are available. Um, so um, capacity building type of uh, research opportunities, um, R01s, um, it, um, et cetera. So there's a, a vast uh, array of different opportunities uh, that are available on this website that actually really target those institutions who are research active uh, institutions and maybe not at that R1 status because as Kenny said, training happens at a broad array of institutions. I started college at a very, very small historically black college, but it had a, it had a MARC program. And that was my introduction to research, you know, as an interest and then as a research career. And then I got my PhD at Penn State, which was definitely, you know, an institution that was not hurting for funding at, you know, at any point in time. So I've had the experience of uh, the, uh, you know, benefiting from these opportunities at a wide array of institutions. So we definitely have that understanding that training takes place across a broad spectrum of institutions and benefits a broad spectrum of people. And we want to make sure that we have opportunities that are available to support this moving into the future. So thank you, Dr. Boone and Dr. Gibbs. Before we wrap up, I do want to ask one question because we haven't really talked about review. And I know Dr. Gibbs, you mentioned that there may be some changes to the review to reflect the changes um, for the grants. How will reviewers be prepared for these changes? They'll be prepared well, because many of you are going to be those peer reviewers. And so you've come to the webinar, you'll read the NOFO, and you'll be prepared. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, uh, we're going to work with our colleagues and review policy and the Institute Center um, review offices, review branches that typically manage this to make sure that there is alignment um, for any sort of change. To, per, to go throughout this whole organization, it takes a lot of time, which is why we're talking about this in June when the change there in January, and it takes a lot of people. And so we are going to work to make sure that there is as much understanding about what this means. And it's always the case, you know, reviewers use their own judgment, right? 
we we say now you don't have to be strong in every area to be a strong application that said the ethos is going to be one where we're going to look for things like mentor training we're going to look for career development we're going to look for these different things and so yeah we're not doing the wholesale changes that have been and fellowships or or uh, rpgs research project grants we are just going to align with what we're asking for and so that's uh yeah that's where we are Thank you. So I am going to wrap us up. And then if we have a minute or two, if there's anything in the Q&A that you, either Dr. Boone or Dr. Gibbs or even Dr. Hardison that you want to emphasize before we close out, you can prepare to share that. But let me just wrap up really quickly. And I'm going to thank Dr. Boone and Dr. Gibbs. I'm going to thank everybody behind the scenes that has providing the links, the resources, responding to questions. I do want to remind you to take a look at that web page. You'll find the notice that was talked about today. There are some other resources. Again, don't forget to reach out to the program officer at the Institute or Center of Interest. We are IMA program officer, and I am always willing to talk to people and answer any questions regarding the expectations of the application. And then we will do our best to incorporate these questions into the FAQs. The slides, the recording, and the FAQs will be available to you. And with that, I will say enjoy the rest of the day. But let me just see if you all have anything that you want to share with the audience that you want to emphasize from the Q&A box. Um, I think that one thing is just, you know, don't be afraid that RCR and the recruitment plan, recruitment plan to enhance diversity, recruitment plan. Keep that in mind, especially those individuals that are in certain states where like, I'm not really sure of what to include in my application anymore. Recruitment, targeted recruitment is legal. We should be focusing on this and not afraid to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But you know, because this is going to be an additional review criteria, it's just like with uh, methods for enhancing reproducibility, right? It, and, and these will contribute to the overall impact score. It, it will follow along, you know, that, that same trajectory. It will be weighed in that similar type of way, shape and fashion. So don't, don't be afraid to reach out to NIH to ask questions, you know, before these applications are submitted, we're here to help you. Um, any <coughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, again, we're previewing this now. We're working on the final tweak. So um, Eric, uh, Dr. Boone said, reach out. I would say, reach out in the fall when we have more <laughs> things online, right? <laughs> because we're going to have more resources right now. But um, it is evolving even for us. But as Dr. Boone mentioned, outreach activities to foster awareness for trainees from all background and targeted recruitment to diversify program applicant pools are permissible activities. And we, all of our program, as an agency of the federal agency, as an agency of the federal government, we only do things that are consistent with applicable law. And so we always encourage you all to um, talk with your own general counsel to ensure applicable laws and regulations are followed in program design implementation. Uh, we know many of the laws say, you know, there are exceptions for federal programs, for example, and it's a requirement to make sure that, to Erica's point earlier, we want a biomedical research workforce that can benefit from the full range of perspectives, experiences, and backgrounds that we need to advance discovery and to serve our increasingly uh, diverse nation. So uh, with that, we are so grateful, Anastasia, <laughs> and I also that? want to say, too, oh, that sorry. there there have been a, probably a couple of hundred or at least 300 questions that were submitted to the Q&A, and we were not able to get to them. And what yes. we did is that we focused a lot of attention on questions that we received prior to the webinar. So because we might not have gotten to yours, it doesn't mean that we didn't think that the question was important. You, your colleagues beat you to the punch, right? So what we'll do is that we'll try to make sure that we have, um, we look at those uh, FAQs that were not able to be answered and we'll try to provide um, answers on the um, FAQ documents that we're gonna be providing. And Stacey, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, I think you guys did an amazing job covering everything um, with as far as how this impacts extract and RPPR, you know, like I mentioned earlier, keep an eye out. The area is going to send out communications. Also, the guide notices oftentimes will mention when things are going to be coming down and being in production. So just keep an eye on your inbox. Yes. Thank and you. January 25th, 2025. 2025. January 25th, 2025. Okay. Thank you all so much. And thank, thank you, to you all. Anissa for being a wonderful moderator as well. You're for welcome. Session. So. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> all right. Have a good day.
Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us.